Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Recollection Step, a Grand Archive TCG podcast, part of the Main Deck podcast family. I'm Dan. And I'm Taylor. And uh, today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, like tempo and, and uh, how what cards cost and, and kind of like what that all means in terms of Grand Archive. Um, but before we get into that, uh, Dan, how's your how's your last couple of weeks? <laughs> it's a... Uh, I can safely say it's been a mix. Um, <laughs> I've had some wonderful high points. I had a, I got to stream opening uh, all three of my ALK cases. Uh, I finally broke my streak of bad luck, and I finally pulled a CSR for myself, which I was very pumped about. Um, Tony level two, so that like that was the only thing is it wasn't the shirtless one, but it was it was nice. It was nice so to close. have mm-hmm. so close. But you know what? I'll, I, I'll take it. I like it. I like it a lot. Uh, so that's already sleeved up and ready to use. Um, had a great trip for a different card game to Paris, which was awesome. And then I got sick for like, uh, well, ongoing, like a week and a half <laughs> uh, so far. So that part has not been fun. Um, and that has really delayed. I wanted to like start put, pumping out a couple like deck profiles for Grand Archive and everything with Alk. But like, it's just been, this is one of the first days where I've I've felt like I can actually do anything um, record anything. So, uh, how about you, Taylor? <laughs> How's yep. your life been? <laughs> I've been good. Uh, thankfully I've been very not sick. Um, I also got my elk product and got through ripping that and I hit a, uh, Arisana level two CSR. Um, so pretty happy about that. Pretty jazzed. Um, and yeah, I mean, life's been good. It's been very chill on my end. Um, so no, uh, no sweet, uh, card game trips for me yet uh until this weekend so until this weekend well actually yeah when this is airing you will in fact be down in ontario and uh getting all ready to disqualify everybody uh every round if possible (laughs) no hopefully none of that happens uh yeah i will i'll be judging the event and yeah i you know i'm very much hoping for a very smooth event and every everybody has a really good time um and the, the event concludes and there's no hitches or anything um, yeah, should be I was also I was super looking forward to going down there and just being able to meet with people and everything likely would have been in the same possession of position as you is just uh, unable to play. So judging or something. Um, but uh, but alas, I got pulled to another fun card game event somewhere else. So mm. um, so Ontario is going to be exciting, though, because I mean, obviously, this is everybody's kind of I think all the competitive players are really in the tank right now, mm-hmm. like trying to come up with the best possible decks, given that elk has been out for just a couple of weeks. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And we're already, we're kind of seeing some front runners, uh, show up for this new format. Um, there's been a couple of tournaments that are, I've had like a good amount of players. Um, so Yeti gaming does an online, uh, webcam tournament and they've had some results put up on Luxera's map. And then also in the uh, Grand Archive Discord Discord server, um, they had a tabletop simulator tournament as well, um, where that wasn't they weren't uh, getting that on like card availability or, or you know your own collection. They just said play whatever you want, since, especially since it's so close to release. Um, so we've got some cool lists that are popping up already uh, from that. Like there's some sweet uh, Ranger lists, some sweet Guardian lists, a lot of really cool stuff going on. You still see some Merlin, uh, obviously, because Merlin's so good. And I suspect like we haven't seen the last of a lot of the Dawn of Ashes champions because there's still just a lot of power there. Um, some of them might have to wait a little bit longer for the right meta to come back into play. Like I suspect Rai is going to be kind of tough to to play into some of these more aggressive decks. Um, yeah. There's just like a ton of a ton of allies being thrown onto the field right now. Rai, I think we we talked about this in a previous episode. You know, Rai, Rai will have to f- either figure out how to control the board better, focus on that a little bit more. Like, I, I think we've we've I think we're on the record as saying if you're just playing this like solitaire style Rai deck, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble because there's there's too much that you have to answer right now. But if the meta slows, if if you get a few of these mid range decks coming in and kind of controlling those ally decks, 
that that's the opportunity where Rai can swing in and go, oh, you're not putting enough pressure on me, huh? All right. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. then you lose. Yes. Yep. So we'll see how that all, all cycles back around. And and I'm really excited to see uh, what people decide to bring to Ontario and and what performs well there, because it's I'm sure there's going to be some really cool spice. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very exciting. We've internally had a few decks that we've been looking at that are um, uh, interesting. I think some interesting decks and um, just not, it feels like not enough time to to test everything before really throwing it all out there. But it's yeah, it'll, it'll just be really fun to watch for mm-hmm. sure. Yep. Um, yeah, with that, I think we uh, we can hop right into our topic here today. Um, but before we do, Dan, maybe it, this is a good time to kind of um, give our listeners, uh, tell our listeners how they can continue to help support the podcast and the channel. Oh, thank you so much for giving this opportunity. I appreciate that, Taylor. <laughs> yes. Uh, as usual, just a quick remark about how you can support us. If you do enjoy the podcast that you listen to and the Main Deck Podcast family, and you want to give us some, some support, you can always do the usual things on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. All that stuff is really, really great and uh, just you know helps us get found and helps other people uh, know that it's content that they might like also. Um, if you're listening on a podcast app, we've been getting a number of reviews on our, on our podcast, which has been wonderful. I appreciate the five-star reviews, dropping them on iTunes, on Spotify, all that kind of stuff. That's really, really great. Um, thank you guys so much for everyone who's done that. And if you take a moment to do that, we'd really appreciate it. The other thing you can do if you want to financially support us without spending any extra money, we do of course have the Patreon where you can put some money in, but if you, if you just want to go, you want to buy some ALK cards and you would be cool with a little kickback going towards us at no cost to you, we got a TCG player affiliate link that you can use. Uh, that would be, uh, down in the description below of this video, or you can go to bit.ly slash shop TCGs. That's bit.ly slash shop TCGs. Type that in shop away, and then we'll get a little kickback at no extra cost to you. So that's always super appreciated as well. Thank you guys so much for your support. Now, Taylor, um, Taylor, you came to me today and you said, you know what? We're talking about tempo. And I said, that sounds good. Yeah. So what do you, what do you got in mind? Yeah. So tempo is a a really vague concept and, um, I'm, I'm not going to try and dial it in too much for this episode just because it, it, there's a lot of different ways we can kind of go. And I want to, I want to make sure we're free to just kind of talk about, you know, whatever comes up. Um, and it kind of related to that too, is like the idea of like a curve, um, in other TCGs, you might hear about how like you plan to curve your turns out, uh, throughout the game. Like, um, in other games that have like a, a mana or a kind of like a progressive resource system where each turn you get another resource. Oftentimes you play like a one cost card into a two cost card into a three cost card turn after turn and grand archive doesn't really have that concept because you play with cards from your hand and you start with a seven card hand and well or six if you're playing with serene spirits and so you essentially can play almost any card you want uh as soon as the game starts um barring advanced element cards um so like the idea of like curving out in tempo is just really different uh, in this game compared to like other t- TCGs. And that's actually, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about Grand Archive is just because it's like, it, it really like for, for someone who's, who's played a lot of trading card games, it really just gives you a different angle to, to consider the game from and like figure out how your, what your cards are actually worth and when you want to play them and, and things like that. Um, so I guess like to start off, a lot of it is just kind of like figuring out <clears throat> exactly like when you want to play your cards and what, what the opportunity cost of a lot of those cards is. Do you think um, maybe we could begin actually by kind of comparing to another card game to really get this idea? Cause like a lot of this is like transferred concepts, you know, mm-hmm. from, from magic, the gathering as a, as a good example. Right. So when you're talking about, and for people who haven't played magic, the Gathering, we will make it straightforward for you. We're not going to get too into the weeds here and with words you don't understand, but um, when you talk about a tempo deck in, in like, for example, magic Taylor, mm-hmm. what's, um, what's kind of, what's the advantage that you're getting when you're trying to gain tempo in that game specifically? Uh, well, generally you're, you're trading cards in order to help like progress the game further. So you're, you're kind of giving up cards in order to gain time in some fashion, whether that's like to buy yourself more turns to play the game or to like close the game out and finish the game, you know, a turn or two sooner, sooner or something similar to that. So, you know, I, I like to think about cards, uh, and there, it's not limited to this, but cards that have effects that are like, uh, return 
that creature to your opponent's hand. Um, mm-hmm. That kind of stuff. You know, there are some uh, there are some creatures in that game where they'll have a maybe a slightly higher cost than a like a vanilla creature, but they might even like they come into play and they get to return a creature to your opponent's hand effectively. What we're talking about here is you're spending that amount of resources to get sort of like a body on the board, which can can progress you towards winning the game by attacking. And you're kind of like negating in a way your opponent's previous turn where you're like saying, you know, well, that didn't happen. Now you have to redo that yep. um, at a later date. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I uh, like a, a, a grand archive example of like bouncing your opponent's uh, ally would be uh, like Zephyr, right? If your opponent puts out a big taunt ally on their board on their turn um and you're trying to swing into them you can zephyr that ally on the end of their turn um probably for less resources than what your opponent put into the ally uh and then uh that ally is just gonna be gone on your turn and you're free to attack whatever target you want instead of the taunted ally um and it costs you just you know two resources instead of whatever they put into their their ally and so you're you're giving up that card because like zephyr is not actually gaining you a card in hand or anything like that but you're you're progressing that game state forward because you're n- now you're able to attack whatever you want, which is probably their champion, and deal damage and hopefully get them to like lethal. So I think if we could really get to like the the essence of the idea of tempo, it's that um, because I think people get very stuck into like raw numbers a lot yeah. of the time. It's like you know how much health you know am am, am I losing health? That's not good. Uh, am I drawing cards? I should be doing that. But the concept is that at the end of the game, uh, the amount of health you have left and the amount of cards you have left in hand don't win you any bonus points, right? Mm -hmm. It's the the point of of a tempo style play is it's you're sort of giving up uh, some sort of some amount of longer term resources with this expectation that you will be able to finish the game before that becomes particularly relevant to you right is that mm-hmm. kind of a good way of maybe phrasing it yes that is perfect thank you mm-hmm. yeah um yeah again like if you're the merlin player and you're just playing out a bunch of ghosts of pendragon um and drawing a bunch of cards off of that uh, and you've got like eight cards in hand but you never find your fireball to f- actually finish the game um you know your opponent can just still kill you at some point like you're not actually really doing anything at that point i mean you're putting a three four on the board so that, that is pretty impactful as well um ghost is if, a good card <laughs> yeah it's so good uh but like if you're playing into a, like a fire aggro xander deck right uh who's got a lot of extra reach involved like they've got blazing throws that deal damage to your face they have uh prepared explosive or planted explosives that deal damage to face like um you you just need to you need to finish the game out at some point because otherwise they'll finish the game um, so you do, yeah, like you said, it just doesn't matter how many cards you draw if you're Ghost of Pendragon or your Merlin or anything like that. If you end the game at you have zero health left, left but eight cards in hand, you just you know you get a participation trophy there. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and a lot of that is just kind of like it, I want to get into concepts about like how you can trade cards for tempo, and you can also trade tempo for cards too. Like, right? Like, it, maybe you do just need more cards to get through the game um, because you're not in danger of like losing the game in the next turn or two. And so you can you, you can draw some cards now and use those to um, in the next turn or two after that extend that your advantage somehow uh, and continue to prolong the game so you can actually use those cards. Um, kind of. So the really like what really kind of brought me want to want to talk about this topic some more is. Uh, the idea of like wanting to play creative shock, which is an extremely powerful card in grand archive. Uh, Cause it generally will um, <clears throat> leave you up like in card advantage versus wanting to play just like a, like kind of like a baseline two, three ally for three, right. Um, mm. Which is going to leave you card neutral or down a card, depending on how you view the ally on the board. Um, you, you, you're definitely going to have less resources to actually play cards from your hand. So in that that sense, like you definitely give up card advantage, um, or card potential maybe is a better term for it. This is like again, this is kind of why I am really drawn to Grand Archive is because like a lot of these concepts are getting flipped on their head when you have to use your cards from hand to play your cards. It's um, it's just so interesting to me. Um, but anyway, like those are kind of like those are my my two baseline like measurements of of what is a tempo positive play in playing the ally. And what is a tempo negative play in playing Creative Shock? 
Um, yeah, so, kind so of- we're, you're kind of approaching this from maybe like an angle of, let's say we're gonna put to, we're gonna put together a new deck. We wanna we wanna mm-hmm. build a new a new fire deck of some kind. And you're sitting there, you're you're thinking about what goes in your list, and then you go, well, it's a fire deck, so we put in creative shock, right? Mm-hmm. And then you start tweaking the list, and you start thinking, do I need to play creative shock, right? Like it's like it's this concept of you know, I guess I, from some some angle too, like not just assuming that whatever people tend to do is the the correct uh, the correct thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and instead maybe, you know, thinking about what value is this card slot giving me in this deck? And is this, is this actually working towards what my true goal is? And I can see now where, yeah, that makes sense. It's where you're thinking like, what's the, um, what's the tempo advantage I get from getting this, this card on board, this ally on board. And is that going to be better in a lot of circumstances than just trying to, you know, develop my hand advantage? Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, because Creative Shock is great for helping you get to level three. Um, potentially, it's even a tempo positive play in the long term in that fashion, right? Um, and it's great at helping you kind of filter your draws. But if your deck is already very consistent, you don't really need to filter your draws too often. If all your cards do the same thing, like if they're all just two, three allies for three, or there's some amount of like uh, direct damage to your opponent, you, you don't really need to see Creative Shock that often because you're going to just see your cards that you want to see anyway. Uh, whereas like a deck like Merlin, right, really wants to see Creative Shock because uh, there's a lot of different effects in that deck and it needs a lot of different cards at different stages of the game. Um, and it also really wants to put Floating Memory in its graveyard for like multiple reasons. Um, so it just kind of like f- knowing what your game plan is uh, in your deck and how you can kind of build your deck to, to uh, you know, propel it forward is is kind of really where we're getting down to now. Um, kind of like two Frostborn Paladin is another another example I have of um like a card that is just very strictly powerful, but is not really an auto include in every single water deck. I think um the same way like Creative Shock I don't think is an auto include in in fire decks. So Frostborn Paladin is a two three for three uh, with intercept, and then it also has on enter. Uh, you can banish a card with floating memory from your graveyard if you do put a draw a card and put a buff counter on Frostworn Paladin. Um, and that's just an awesome effect, right? It's really good. It's just, it's already got the two, three for three baseline stats that we want to see in our kind of more aggressive allies, right? Uh, and then it can also just be card neutral. Uh, you can play it and give up a, well, card neutral. Sem- semi-card neutral. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> not it keeps not you, exactly. Yeah, keeps you even on resources to pay for reserve costs, um, which, um, is like well, I think what a lot of people care about, but also like if you banish that floating memory, you, it's one less card to pay for a material deck card. So you just kind of have to balance that, right? But again, uh, Frostworn Paladin is like a really good aggressive play. It's a good defender against allies, but it's not something necessarily every deck wants to play. Um, so I have been kind of testing on and off for you know since Dawn of Ashes essentially um, a water luxum xander list that just wants to go long it wants to get to level three and it wants to accumulate advantage over multiple turns by revealing uh luxum sites and light weavers assaults to xander level three's effect um to you know just heal yourself up and ping some damage and you're gonna just slowly grind your opponent out of resources right um and like on on face it seems like frostworm paladin is kind of a lot of what that deck wants right um it's a, a blocker to help stymie aggression. It um, you know can help add cards back into your hand and use floating memory because a lot of water decks just have excess floating memory. Um, but it's it's often not like a play you want to make because it those cards you're going to use to pay for Frostworm Paladin are often used to better set up like levels more efficiently or to keep you alive for longer um, in a better fashion than Frostworm Paladin is. Um, and since that's a deck that just really wants to grind the opponent out of resources, you need to play cards that are going to help you like play a really, really long game and not just kind of like play a game where you can kind of jockey for position with your opponent. That's interesting. I mean, I, I would have, I mean, I, I've seen we, when we, when we messed around with Xander, we played Frostworn Paladins in it. And it's, been, it's interesting to hear you sort of, uh, 
I guess just approach it from a different angle, but I, I can see what you're saying, you know, mm-hmm. when you compare it to you, when we think strictly like that creative shock versus ally play, you know, it's, it's the question of a card that is building you the advantage that you require to go to level three, you know, when, when in a deck that wants to go to level three, creative shock is a lot nicer because mm-hmm. it's going to help you set up that floating memory. It's going to help get cards uh, into your hand. I mean, it's again, it's a it's a card neutral play, but when you're pitching a floating memory to it um, or helping yourself find things like Dungeon Guide or something, it's it's mm-hmm. that's where it can it uh, veers into actually being more advantage than anything. Um, and those plays for level three are critical because getting to level three with resources active is how you kind of establish that late game mm-hmm. uh, dominance of these decks. And yeah, Frostor and Paladin kind of is contradictory yes. to some of that in in a way that I hadn't necessarily thought through as deeply. Um, it is a powerful interceptor, um, for sure. But uh, if that isn't actually actively defending you in a way that is useful, depending on what sort of threats you're dealing with, then that isn't relevant either. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I when, like before... Fractured Crown came out. Um, I was pretty high on Frostborn Paladin in that list, just because we, you know, the limited card pool. Um, it was just one of the best water cards you could play, and there was not really an alternative at that point. Um, once FTC came out, uh, I hadn't really looked at the list quite as much, um, but uh, it, that was a card that I was kind of already seeing. I was seeing like was just not pulling its weight in that that list. Uh, I started to think about kind of why, and, and it was just like. It just the, the the issue is it, it takes a lot of setup in order to make it a um, card neutral play for yourself, um, and that setup you already are are trying to use to level up efficient efficiently. So it just eats into that, and then even if you just play it as a base two three interceptor, um, it's not actually big enough to kill a lot of like the more popular allies that are s- swinging at you. So it's it's somewhat it's like a roadblock for your opponent, but it's not going to actually stop them for very long. Um, it's just kind of like a mild annoyance. And then of course, it, like if your opponent wants to use something like Zephyr again, like they're, you know, going to come out ahead in that tempo exchange, uh, cause they can just Zephyr that end of your turn. And now it's gone and can't block anything on their turn. Um, it's sort of like in, in those situations, it's a stalwart shield mate that doesn't protect you or doesn't, doesn't progress you when it dies. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the yes, advantage yep. of shield mate. Mm-hmm, exactly. Um, even like Frostbind is a card that I you waffle on a little bit in like my Water Xander lists, just because um, it's so, sometimes it can be tough to actually like leave up and have be impactful in the game. Um, so Frostbind is a, the uh, fast action for two and lets you negate uh, card activation unless its controller plays to reserve. Um, so it's you know it's a really powerful play and that can stop key cards, but. It's also like somewhat easily telegraphed and your opponent can see it. And then at the end of the day, also, it's still just a one for one. So it leaves you down a card to actually like, again, you know, help yourself set up to, to get to level three efficiently. Um, and that deck just really, really wants to keep a hand size until it gets to three. So let me ask you this. We've, we've kind of determined that uh, an ally play like Frostthorn Paladin is maybe less ideal in this sort of like longer game control Xander list. Uh, what lists do you think Frosthorn Paladin then has a, a positive tempo benefit for you in? Um, a lot of these water ally lists that are popping up, um, I think is like the best home for Frosthorn Paladin. Um, any list that just wants a baseline two, three for three is going to be very, very happy with it because it's going to give you a lot of extra options on top of the, the base two, three for three that you're, you're, you're probably just going to swing at face a lot of the times anyway. But it just having those extra flexibility um, really can can showcase how strong it is, right? Um, like if I'm just getting really aggressive and I just want to like attack as fast as possible, I can just play it, not worry about banishing floating memory, and it's still going to attack for two every turn. Um, if I see like that, my opponent has a lot of three health allies that they're playing, and I feel like I'm getting somewhat behind on the damage race. I can try and set up you know, a situation where I can have it enter and banish floating memory to get bigger. And now all of a sudden it's a really good blocker in that situation. Right. Um, and I still have like plenty of cards to continue my game plan of like, you know, 
playing allies to the board and trying to, to get ahead that way and, and either control the board or outrace my opponent. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just weaker in a control shell because it doesn't control the board as much as you need it to. And it also does not give you the card advantage you need it to, but it is a really good like tempo. Uh, like it, it, it can close a game out fairly quickly on its own. So in those examples of those, those ally focused decks, I just, I, what I'm really trying to do, I'm trying to kind of, I'm trying to be the audience here and, and try and get yeah. everyone on the same page as you two. So, um, I guess the way we can look at it is that a Frosthorn Paladin is maybe there to, if it's already a solid ally for you, if you're like, yeah, I'm cool with a two, three for three, then Frosthorn Paladin is quite advantageous in those decks because it allows you to take some of the incidental floating memory that water happens to have a little more incidental floating memory across useful cards than some of the other elements do already. Mm -hmm. So you may have just, you know, you may have played a fracture eyes on something for example, um, or, you know, fast cure, your, your shield mates or whatever. You just end up playing in there. And I don't know if you play shield mm -hmm. mate in that deck, but, um, you play some, some things that have some floating memory on it. Um, and the, if you are like, if your deck is actively interested in using that floating memory, because you're trying specifically to go to a high level and kind of control the game to that point, then it's, you know, it's not really doing that much for you by banishing a floating memory and turning it into a card in hand. Card in hand is technically better than a floating memory in mm. a lot of circumstances, but not necessarily what you want to be spending the, like you said, the, the tempo to do, yeah. the, the turn mm. to do, the the resources to do that turn. It's not yep. gaining you that much. But in those decks where you're going to sit at level one, maybe go to two sometimes, and you just incidentally get some floating memory in there. Instead, now you're looking at a three, four for three that, actually like legitimately gains you advantage yes because that floating memory wasn't as useful to you before mm -hmm. yeah like if you're like a water lorraine deck and you aren't on the go to spirit ruler plan and you're just going to sit at level one or two maybe like two as like your finishing move that floating memory is not super useful in the in the graveyard like what are you doing with it nothing you just you might play a drawn blade at some point, but then you probably have more floating memory because it's water. And like you said, there's lots of really good incidental floating memory in that element. Um, so like that's the perfect time when you want to play that card is in these, these kind of lower to the ground. They're not going to go to level three decks and they're probably not playing a long game um, on the opposite end. So um, a, a uh, water ally. Um, oh, sorry. I was getting ready to sneeze there. Um <laughs> <laughs> a water alley that ally that really does play a long game really well is it's um wave rider protector that we've been seeing pop up in in these water uh tony lists that Tenaris lists that, that have been then showing up in these last two tournaments um and that essentially is just the water stalwart shield mate except bigger um and it is just an excellent card that is that's what you want to see as a control deck because it's got a big butt it's going to take a significant resource from the opponent to actually like permanently remove. And then when it, they do remove it, you get some really nice floating memory to help you level up. Um, uh, up and the yeah, top of my does, head, it's a, it's a one, four is a one, four for taunt. four. If I remember correctly with taunt and floating memory, uh, those are both class bonus, but, um, again, you're like, yeah, it's for four. Uh, you're, you're leveling up fairly, fairly quickly as Tanaris anyway. Um, and this, this just continues to help with that. Um, or if you're playing uh, Academy guide, right. With water to Norris, it's an excellent protector of that. And then if they do take care of it, it helps you pay for your reduced champion levels now. Mm. So just like, it is just like the perfect, like kind of go along piece for that deck. Um, and like the difference is why that's really good in, in water control lists and Frostworn Paladin is less good is, is subtle. Because on the surface, they look very similar, right? Um, they both are card neutral. They both interrupt your opponent somehow. Pseudo um, card neutral. Again, like yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> it, like assuming you're going to use the floating memory or can banish floating memory for, for, for Frostworn Paladin, they are, they're influence neutral is maybe the best way to say it. Um, they, uh, um, they just, the, the difference is subtle uh, because it just, one of them is a lot more difficult to deal with than the other one and it for i i can't explain it 
but the the act of playing the ally and having it go to the graveyard to continue to be a resource for you just flows better than the act of having like eating a card from your graveyard and drawing it. If well, that I think sense. I think it comes down to the fact that the, I mean that it is a there is an additional cost. You're losing the the frostborn paladin leaves your hand and the floating memory leaves your graveyard mm-hmm. in order to return one card back to your hand. That's a that's where it's if you're actually ah, yeah. interested in leveling. That's two cards out of your hand to replace with one or out mm-hmm. of your quote unquote hand, right? Where that floating yeah. memory does does come into play. Um, whereas uh, with with the I totally forgot his name. Pr- the wave rider protect- protector, wave rider protector, something protector, some kind of mm-hmm. was new cards. Everyone we're still getting used to all the names. Uh, the wave rider protector is one card out of hand. That is is you know, outside of your opponent choosing to interact with it in certain ways is going to lead directly towards that sort of long game play of just, I'm, I'm going to soak up some damage. And when he does his job and soaks up that damage, he immediately replaces himself uh, mm-hmm. rather than losing two cards for one. It's one for one. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. And I like that's, I mean, I think that's really the key. It doesn't really matter that he has lower power necessarily because that's not something that is is actually that important uh in these in these strategies because these strategies are designed to go later and and just have a control over the game establish a control over the game at some point where um you know your your goal with the control deck isn't really to one for one your opponent right Pl- mm-hmm. like play a thing a- attack you were just talking about frostbind as another example like Frostbind isn't there just to, you know, oh, here's, yeah, here's a good opportunity. I'll counter that ally or whatever. I'll just, you know, d- deal with that. When you're playing Frostbind that way, you are playing into the opponent's tempo in a way that is that is not conducive to you winning the game. Because you think about this like ally deck that's just playing two, three allies and attacking. They've got how many of those, right? In the deck, they've got like 40, two, yeah. three allies or something. Mm-hmm. You've got four Frostbinds. And you got one of them. Congratulations. Um, if if that if that saves you the damage that you needed to to like turn the game around in the late game, then sure. I'm not saying that won't happen, but a lot of the time you're just you're you're preventing something that is that you could have dealt with in another way potentially, and going down one card. And putting your opponent down one card, but they're playing the deck that draws more. You're playing the deck that that they're playing the deck that's the whole thing is just I'm going to draw two cards and play two allies every single turn, mm-hmm. you know, at, at my optimal game plan. Where you specifically need to you, like scrimp and save those cards so that you can get to three, and then like Arasana, Comet fall the board or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's it's. Thinking about Frostworm from a perspective of, well, it can attack and kill something. Eh, cool, but not the goal, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. And we'll get into we'll get into these these ally decks that are like playing one or two allies a turn and then drawing two cards a turn later because that is another big tempo consideration. But yeah, that, that's exactly why like Frostbind is kind of rough for some of these decks. Like you just your your opponent can play around it and and you have to hit a key card with it for it to really be impactful. Like exactly. If you can hit, if you if you get a fireball with it, like awesome, you're in great shape. Like you probably just saved yourself the game. Um, we've yeah, we've talked a lot about in in some of our like just discussion for metagame type stuff. Mm-hmm. We've talked about the like the thing the reasons you actually play Frostbind, uh, Spirit Blade and Soul, right? Like yep. if you hit your opponents in Soul, they're Incarnate Majesty or something in that late game. That is, I mean, there. You're looking too with Frostbind at like the expenditure of resources on either mm-hmm. side. That's again, really, if you're spending two for your Frostbind to get there, they spent three for their ally. Like, you know, like that's not a, you that's not a huge that gain. <laughs> but if you're hitting the Ensoul, that was their entire turn and that's how they were going to win the game. You hit the Incarnate Majesty. That's how they were going to stabilize and not lose. That's where you're like, okay, like this is where this card is valuable. So I urge people to, Make sure you're playing Frostbite on the right target for sure, mm-hmm. because it's a it's a huge tempo play exactly. um, to be able to gain those that sort of like resource advantage on your opponent. Mm. Yeah, 
Um, and one, one kind of last water card I want to talk about is maybe probably the quintessential like example of tempo in water is uh, chilling touch, right? Mm. Uh, this is a, a one cost action uh, with floating memory and you banish a card at random from target op- opponent's memory. And then a, you return that card to their memory at the beginning of their next end phase. So you essentially remove a card from your hand to remove a card from your opponent's influence, their hand essentially for their next turn. Um, and you get access to your card again before they do, uh, because you get to materialize before they really get their card back into their hand. Um, and when you materialize, obviously you can use the floating memory from chilling touch. Um, and beyond just like, you know, hitting like at random, the key card they put into their memory for whatever reason that just messes up their whole turn. Like that's <laughs> the dream scenario. It we happens love to, to see me that. way more than it should. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you're oh, okay. I can put this down safely. Cause I'm, I'm not going to materialize anything crazy next turn. I know I have the floating memory. All right. I put this card in my memory. It's safe for whatever reason. No chilling touch is going to remove that for you, Dan, and and make you very unhappy. Yeah. Um, but even beyond that dream scenario, right? Like you're, you're taking that uh, resource away from your opponent is like really crucial because depending on what the composition of their hand is, um, they are going to have a really tough time playing cards next turn, depending on what their game plan is. Like if these, a lot of these ally decks rely on lot, on playing a three cost ally and then saving up uh, three cards in hand for interaction on their opponent's turn, right? Um, so now they're down to six cards. Uh, so they have to make another choice between maybe they've got to burn like a, a, a resonance bobble before they want to to draw that extra card in materialization, or maybe they just abandon that plan entirely and they get something else from materialization. Um, but they're, unless they ha- like already had an extra card somehow or something, they're not. They're not playing their three cost ally and their two cost spell anymore for for interaction there. They're doing one or the other, doing something else entirely. So you just kind of really like start to throw them for a loop. And it costs you very little in terms of both cards and uh, tempo because it only costs one resource. So you only need two cards in hand to play it. Um, so this is it's just like kind of the really best example of of you know these kind of tempo plays we can make on our opponent and and put ourselves ahead while still like you know, working to maintain neutral card advantage. There are plays that, that for newer players can be harder to determine when or why those are actually like useful to do as well. Like especially chilling touch is a card where I think a lot of newer players see it and don't fully grasp the, you know, the actual impact of going down that like one card can have again, outside of the scenario where like you just randomly throw a dart and hit the card that, matters the most to them or something Mm -hmm. um but you know try try banishing a random card from your hand before you take your turn in a random game just just like when you're playing for fun with your opponent be like hey i just want to see something and just like shuffle and set a card aside and then figure out if you still have a good turn Mm -hmm. uh (laughs) compared to to not you'll have some you'll have some situations where it's you're like okay like it's not a big deal here the thing is generally in those situations where it wasn't a big deal um, your turn was kind of suboptimal already, which is kind of unfortunate, but like we, you know, I like to play, you know, me, I like to play these decks that do a lot of the, the, uh, fire, um, card advantage gaining in the first mm-hmm. turn or two. Um, so I'm, I'm playing things like increasing danger. I'm playing, uh, I'm playing things like cremation ritual on, uh, stalwart shield mage or clumsy apprentice, um, just to, like draw a million cards so I can kind of just go to town and with whatever my new strategy is Um, those decks losing one card in hand can sometimes cost you quite a bit because my goal, every time I sit down with those decks to play it, my turn one and turn two goal is I want to play every single card in my hand. I don't want to have any cards left Mm -hmm. at the end because the optimal turns are the ones where you, well, the only cards left might be the card you drew off of increasing danger or something. Right. Um, going down a card can sometimes put you off of playing that creative shock, that increasing danger, that cremation ritual. Um, and th- we, we, when we are testing these decks, we call it velocity quite a bit, but it, it just, mm-hmm. it slows your card velocity down a, a lot where you end up then not being able in the later games and this like trickle effect of to be able to play all the cards you want to then because you didn't, you didn't generate enough right away. Um, so yeah, sneaky card impactful though. Yes. Um, yeah, and and like the decks that are playing Chilling Touch are also set up like to use Chilling Touch 
when they want to, right? Like they're, they're either going to play all their cards efficiently on their turn or the, like it's a low cost way for them to do something and still leave up interaction, right? So like these, these decks are more prepared for, for being down a card randomly on their turn than you are on your turn. Uh, and yet, like that's another reason why it's very impactful. It's it's also kind of a reason you don't see it in a lot of the water ally lists that have been floating around. Um, it it doesn't fit into that game plan very well. Um, you can play an ally, uh, three cost ally, and then you have three cards left in hand on your. Well, I guess like it's again, it's kind of weird, right? Because like you want to do this on your first turn, but then your opponent doesn't actually have a hand yet, so chilling touch doesn't do anything. Uh, if right. you're on the play, and if, if you're, you're on, on the, the draw, play. You want to attack. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. You don't, and if you're on the draw, you can play two, three cost allies and just swing. So like it doesn't really fit into that game plan very well, but these decks that are going a little longer or maybe playing a little more of a, like a mid range strategy, just have more opportunity to take advantage of it and use that to like help propel themselves and buy time to get to level three or whatever they're doing. So can we step back now and take everything we've kind of talked about in the water realm and go back to fire? Yes. Um, because we mm-hmm. we began by talking about creative shock, and you specifically were bringing up these uh, popular fire Xander lists that are that are going around. Now Xander has his cool level two; he's mm-hmm. a little bit spicier. There are some new cards from Alk, uh, like Rococo, that are adding a lot of uh, the damage potential to these decks as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, again, a lot of people sit down with fire decks and they start by slamming their like first cards for creative shock. Like I'm, it's the, it's the goat card. Do you think given what we've talked about is creative shock, a card you put in a Xander list like that? Um, no, I've, I've actually been working on Xander, uh, quite a bit for the, in preparation for the new format. And, um, I have put some in some of my lists. Uh, usually they are like kind of chunkier lists. Uh, like they, they aren't necessarily trying to win as fast as possible. They still want to win very quickly, but um, like those are the lists where I'm trying to like go over some of the other ally lists. Um, and so I'm not necessarily sure. playing the full like package of just burn the opponent out, but I'll, those I've also kind of seen some middling success with just because that's not really what fire Xander wants to do in general anyway. Um, but my, my more successful lists are, all the like all those lists have not included creative shock just because you lose so much time um when you think about what you could play instead of creative shock um and how impactful it is to actually like just finishing the opponent off quickly like is it, there's just really not much of a comparison uh you can play cards for the same cost you can play Korhazi outlook um which is a um no, not outlook one, Korhazi oh uh, courier f- yes Korhazi courier thank courier. you courier uh, a one, two stealth, um, with a class bonus of on hit, you draw a discard and then deal one more to the hit unit. Yep. If it was a fire card discarded. Um, so already like a pseudo cremation shock, except it's more in line with your game plan. Um, cause you're never going to have the mage class bonus as Xander, uh, creative shock. Um, you can play, uh, two Rococos for one more card than you need. Actually, no, no. For the same amount of cards as you need to play a Creative Shock, because you need four in hand, because you need the Creative Shock itself, you can play two Rococos, which is six damage on their own. Um, <laughs> Rococo, by the way, is just an insane card. <laughs> Talk about a good tempo card, right? It, that's a 1-1 a one, one for one, and it will deal two to your opponent on enter. If your influence insane. is four or less. Yes. Yep. Which, which... I mean, actually is kind of an interesting point to bring up just because that really hits at the exact thing we're talking about with tempo. This idea that the number of cards in your hand shouldn't be a concern to you unless it is directly relevant to you playing like the cards you need to win the game, right? You should be your goal with, especially with these like fire Xander decks and and some of these like fire ranger decks that are floating around now Mm -hmm. um, should be to deal as much damage as you can so that by the end of the game, you, you know, you, you end the game is the way I need to put that. Um, where then however many cards are left doesn't really matter. So the, the idea is like having two Rococos in your hand, you just want to play out your hand, play your attacks, play your allies, get them down. Once you have exactly four cards left, Rococo two damage swing. Don't forget to do that. Then you can play a second Rococo, which will then force you to sack one of them because Rococo is unique. Uh, sack the one you attacked with and then two more damage and then swing once more Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, which a very, very powerful play. Like, really accelerates the game there. Like, dealing six damage to your opponent is not nothing, especially for just, you know, four cards from hand. Um, but there's, yeah, like, a rending flame. You can play a rending flames instead of a creative shock, right? Uh, which can deal up to, like, 12 damage in Xander or more. Um, you can just deal, you can do so many things for those. There is cards. a situation though. The, the, the turn one play, what do you, what, what are your thoughts on turn one? Because you can't attack turn mm-hmm. one. There's no spirit to attack. There's That's no correct. opponent to attack. So, yep. I mean, I think our, our creative shock ardent listeners will say, well, the, the reason you play it is to have that turn one velocity, right? Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Um, I, I don't think, I don't hate that, right? Like you, you do need a good turn one play when you're on the play. Um, because just in general, like as Xander, you also want to stop your opponent from having the first materialization. So you're going to want to be on the plate anyway. So you, you need powerful turn one plays when you can't attack and creative shock in theory is that play. Uh, however, fire has such a dearth of floating memory. Um, it's the element with the least amount of inherent floating memory on its cards. Um, actually I was doing the math or I was counting them up the other day. There's one non-class bonus floating memory in fire. Yeah, and then there's, <laughs> believe me, I know. <laughs> there's Separate steel. Every other class has, or every single class has one other floating memory card that has class bonus and fire as well. So Xander has two fire cards with floating memory. And uh, like Xander's a, car, a deck that really wants to just load up on fire cards. Um, it has a lot of like extra synergy with that. And you're going to see that with Ranger and stuff now too, because there's a lot of cards that just care about being able to banish cards from the graveyard to help you either pay, play cards or get better effects on your cards. So you need a you need a, a critical mass of fire cards, uh, and then like the, the the normal floating memory cards you would play also really aren't great in that game plan. Um, Xander doesn't care about fast cure. Xander doesn't care about stalwart shield mate really. Uh, Honorable Vanguard, you you can play and it's fine because it's, it's fine. you know some extra damage a turn and it plays well with Arthur, which you're playing. Uh, Kingdom Informant is the same thing, right? Um, so it's got it's got some floating memory com- it can play, but you really don't care about that. You're not you're not going out of your way to include floating memory in your deck in the first place because you're also just not trying to turbo up to level three. Um, so you just don't I, like it, to me. It's just not a good turn one play in that deck because you're gonna in all likelihood, you're going to draw two cards and then discard something that doesn't have floating memory. Um, or <laughs> even worse, it's going to have class bonus floating memory. So you can't use it on turn two anyway because uh, you're not as, an assassin yet. Um, so it's just like you're paying a lot of cards to do nothing, essentially, um, which is the exact opposite of what that deck wants to do. Yeah, the way I like to think about that is that uh, you're putting these four for assume you're going to put in four creative shocks in your deck Mm -hmm. for this situation it's turn one you drew floating memory non-class bonus floating memory specifically so that you can use it next turn Mm -hmm. and you have no other sequences that are actually like gaining you like I I'm not sure what what exactly your lists are like I know some lists like to do cremation ritual stuff still some lists use cre- mm-hmm. I think increasing danger quite common um, but uh, you you know you don't have a sequence like that that you would prefer to do and you did in fact draw the non class bonus floating memory and you got the play that turn and the cost to that is that now you're going to draw some creative shocks also later in the game when you're basically not at all interested in drawing those. Mm-hmm. which yeah. uh yeah i mean if you're interested in drawing creative shocks later like a like a slower deck is then that's great um like the the go to level three luxum xander fire mm-hmm. lists like sure that's awesome but yeah i i'm i'm with you i feel like it's not a card that i necessarily want to put in that fast deck because it's there are too many parts of the game where it's not actually an optimal play and the one part of the game the one very specific like i have to draw it within these seven cards along with the floating memory and not want to do anything else too it doesn't feel like the gain is enough no it's a it's a contingency plan for a a contingency that's just not impactful to you that much um conversely yeah you said mentioned increasing danger that's a card that is actually, I've been I've been criminally underplaying that in my Xander lists, um, but that's an excellent turn one play in Xander. Um, it 
buys you cards and time because your opponent is not going to get if you're on turn one anyway your opponent's not going to get that extra card because they'll skip the recollections phase um our arthur obviously excellent turn one play for xander um just comes down as immortal right away and uses up a lot of your hand um things like that are really what you want to do things that are either going to like give you more re- actually give you more resources and not hopefully give you more resources or things that are just going to be like sticky um there's a lot of stealth units in Xander too, actually, that I really like to be able to play on turn one, because um, your opponent is not going to likely not going to be able to do much to him. So um, you still have like a, a lot of really good turn one plays in Xander, uh, which makes sense, right? Like you wouldn't you wouldn't want to play this really aggressive deck that's throwing its cards away to kill the opponent if uh, like your turn one was going to be suboptimal half the time. I'm really glad you mentioned Arthur. Um, we we look a lot just when we're deck building at interesting cards that make for good good turn one plays arthur obviously can just come down and be immortal so that the fact Mm -hmm. that he can't attack doesn't matter um he and he will like you said sticky he'll stick on the board stealth units too um we we mess around a little bit and i'm not convinced it's a bad idea still in some builds with lancelot and guardian now too Mm -hmm. um lancelot being one that that can come down and he's hindered which doesn't really matter if you can't attack anyway. So you just you just drop them down there. Um, and that sort of negates a little bit of that tempo disadvantage um, mm-hmm. that he would otherwise get you. Because I mean, the big thing with Grand Archive is that everything everything has what we call in the magic world haste, but everything can attack the turn it comes into play. So it it does mean that, you know, the the reason that these allies can be so effective and can have such a good tempo uh to them is because they can just immediately crash in and we have to be thinking about how we operate around our our turn ones but also be thinking about when when we're talking about those allies like are we okay with things coming into play tapped and what happens when our opponent plays a lunette or something against us Mm -hmm. um actually yeah allies are are, now that you bring them up are are one of the main ways that like wind gains a lot of tempo advantage because they take such good advantage of of allies coming down and being able to attack right away um, and this is earlier in the, in the episode when I, t- when you had mentioned, um, these decks drawing two cards a turn, this is often how they can uh, afford to pay for the tempo of being able to, to play two cards a turn is being able to play a grand, uh, crusaders ring and like a corresponding resonance bobble and just be able to actually draw multiple cards a turn and, and pay for these things. Um, and they have a lot of like, wind has a lot of really good two cost interaction spells. They've got Zephyr, they have to Dipl- displace. Um, they also have favorable wins, which is not two cost, but it fits in that because it's one cost. <laughs> um, so it's it's really easy for them to just like play a bunch of allies, eat, like one one a turn, one of these three costs, two threes for uh, each turn, and then also hold this interaction up and still be able to like refill their hand if they need to. Right? Um, they can go through these turns and and get really nice, huge tempo positive plays on their opponent because their opponent likely has to devote multiple cards to killing a two three right off the bat. Um, just cause so many allies have only two power or a lot of spells will only deal two damage. So it's tough to actually like actually kill these, these allies before they, they get another swing off. Um, but besides the first one that if you can like mitigate this attack somehow, like if they swing one ally in, they swing a second one to kill your two, three and use Zephyr, the second attacker, like <laughs> your, or your own ally, either one, right? Like all of a sudden you're way ahead in the, in the tempo game because they've spent their whole turn doing essentially nothing and you dealt two damage to them and still have an ally on the board. You spent half your turn, right? If you want to just look yeah. at how much of your hand you spent exactly. each way. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. And and boy, like I, I keep calling back to it, but in, in Houston when we, uh, I had the, the absolute honor of commentating that final game between the true champion guys where they were playing the wind ally mirror match. Um, that is uh I'll, if i remember i'll link it in the description here for people to watch that's a i mean that was a master class of mm-hmm. tempo oriented play uh as the two were just it was very difficult to tell um to the to the untrained eye um including my eye <laughs> who who was at any point the in the stronger position because they just kept kind of jockeying their allies back and forth um and uh, just we're constantly trying to make these value positive uh, plays while c- trying to push that you know that clock towards their favor each turn. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
and actually, um, now that we're talking about it more like that, like, I think you had just, did you just say something about like how many cards you had left up in hand? Uh, yeah. This was right before you started talking about, um, Houston, but that's like a really good way to measure if you're, um, playing for tempo or if you're playing for card advantage, right. Is like, how many cards do you have left in your hand when you go to recollection? Um, I, do you have a, like a pretty full grip? You're probably not playing for tempo too much. If you've used up all your cards and used use them very efficiently everything's in your memory like you're you're probably playing a very tempo-y game uh, where you're trying to like give up cards for turns or for, for time um instead of trying to like buy time or buy cards by giving up time or, or something like that right um and that, like that's a really good way to kind of just figure out like what pace your deck is trying to play at um but yeah back to these like these wind ally decks like that like there's just so much really good uh tempo uh, examples here too like gildas is yet another one of that might be the best one um it just sets you up for these plays so well because that's a, a one three for three and then it has balance and balance is when your your hand and your memory are equal in amount so like for instance you have three cards in hand and three cards in memory which you will often have on turn one after playing about a gildas um it gets plus three power so now all of a sudden it's a, a four three right um, so it just really rewards you for playing that game where you, you want to be really efficient with your cards and play them out all out each turn. Yep. Yeah. Wind is, um, wind and Gildas go hand in hand too, because they have a number of ways of just like manipulating the number of cards in their hand by playing. Uh, I mean, squirrel and ace and protector is, was like the really popular play. Mm-hmm. Squirrel is already a good way just to like adjust your number of cards for balance, but then ace and protector gets to double up on that advantage by then like you attack with the squirrel, then just bounce that squirrel back to hand to sort of pay that, that on enter cost that he has. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Wind, <laughs> wind is just a, an like we like to think of wind as, as a, a mid rangey element a lot of the time. Um, but it like a lot of its plays, like we started this conversation talking about Zephyr, um, uh, things like reclaim too, in, in some circumstances work, work this way, but it, it has a lot of plays that can really just try and gain little tempo advantages against your opponent and where that that's where that, like the allies deck saw success is where mm-hmm. they started to really capitalize on. Okay. We're just like the exact allies aren't that important outside of a few of them, two threes for three, and then tempo cards and they just manage the tempo of the game. And that ended up being, uh, a, a sweepingly effective, um, strategy for, for enabling aggro, uh, in the game that, that sort of changed how a lot of people perceived how to build decks as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That definitely affected, uh, my deck building skills for sure. Like you, you just see a lot more value in allies after that, because it, it, it makes sense that they're very valuable when they can come in and attack the turn they come in. But when you see how they can be used to just generate all this advantage, um, and outplay your opponent like that, you really start to understand like, oh, these are actually like really, really valuable in comparison to, to other trading card games where sometimes they're just like, sometimes you play them, sometimes you don't. And we have an interesting new metagame forming where we have Tenoris, who has the capability of on his on his card protecting your allies, going to level mm-hmm. one, taunting your opponent um, and keeping making it easier to keep those allies in play. Um, and you know, where, where it's, it's easy to think about the number of cards in hand as like how much, how much advantage you're getting versus your opponent. We talked about the frostbind earlier. I, I paid two and they paid three. Um, I paid two, they paid seven. Well, that's a, obviously a gain. Um, but it's less obvious to be able to translate the amount of damage that you've dealt to the amount of cards that you've, you've spent, um, effectively mm-hmm. not just losing cards, but then the, the reserve costs and everything. Um, but I think it's pretty easy to just feel out the fact that if you are able to keep your ally into play for two turns and deal twice as much damage, that is tempo positive <laughs> in oh, some yes. way. <laughs> so that's where you know that's where wind is is quite effective. Favorable wins, like you know, we've all gotten one time that like clutch favorable wins play, and the opponent like just can't even kill it, and they spent their whole turn trying to deal with something. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, even better is just like uh, I put out two allies. I leveled to to Norris, and so I had taunt. My opponent couldn't do anything about it. Those allies fostered. That's the other. That's the other new mechanic. That's like the the 
gain in value for keeping the ally out again. Um, sometimes very direct, like very direct gain in value, like the re- the recruiter letting you yep. just get another card in hand. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, allies allies already. It's you know you can measure their their advantage, and some people don't like to, but should be measuring their advantage in the amount of tempo they gain you through dealing damage. Mm-hmm. But um, now we have even a host of other things that they can do to sort of gain you value as well if you can protect them. Exactly. Yep. Um, and before we wrap up here, there's uh, two two last cards I want to talk about quick because they they very literally translate into just like tempo advantages. Uh, and that's um, Beseech the Winds and Dungeon Guide, right? Mm. They they buy you a whole nother step, essentially, um, or a whole nother phase in your turn. Um, you're giving up a card in both cases to get that, but um, you're going to get essentially an extra materialization phase out of it. Um, and it's oftentimes, if you're trying to get to level three really quickly, or if there's a key card you need out of your material deck right there, that it's oftentimes very valuable to give up the card of Beseech the Winds and and go down a card in hand to get that materialization. Um, and just like the the very, very definition of, of trading cards for tempo there. Some uh, Something that I thought of, and I will, I'm sure I'll relate this to what you're talking about in just a second. I have to let my mind get there for a sec. Um, but when we were when we were prepping for Houston and we were trying to figure out things like when do we play, when do we when do we take the play, when do we take the draw, mm-hmm. when we or in other words, when do we choose to go first and choose to go second when we win the die roll? Um, I liked to start like I had this heuristic where I, I would think about in these with these two decks, who prefers to get the first attack phase and who prefers to get the first materialize phase? Mm-hmm. Um, and that is a good way. I like if you if you don't know the matchups deep enough quite yet, and and you don't know some of the like the real the real inner workings of the decks. That's a good just quick way of kind of coming to what's usually a pretty decent decision between the two. If if it's really important that you get to attack first, going second is sometimes a better call. If you it's really important that you need to get the the you need to like level up faster than them, or you need to materialize something really important before they get like a nullifying lantern or something before they get a chance to uh do something then you definitely want to be taking the first turn to get that that uh, materialized before your opponent does um and dungeon guide and beseech the winds give you an advantage of kind of letting you take an extra materialize like that whenever it is relevant to you most common scenarios being i'm playing a deck like arasana or rai where i need to level up as fast as possible uh we've seen some interesting ranger builds that are trying to dungeon guide to three just so they can like uh shadows twin double taser shot your opponent or something um Um, i'm disappointed you didn't bring up the everybody's favorite matchup of uh fire merlin versus fire merlin (laughs) <laughs> where getting to level two first is extremely important. No, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a perfect example, though. It's like getting to level two Merlin before your opponent gets to level two Merlin. Uh, well, God, I hate that matchup so much. I hate having to deal with I'm just having traumatic flashbacks now to the, the, the Mexican standoff of both of us having Merlin in play. Like, like, like getting, like, who's going to reach for their gun first <laughs> to try and banish a floating memory or something. I hate having to think through those scenarios though. That's, that was like my least favorite thing to do playing those decks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, just the, the most like perfect example of why you might want to play be on the play in that matchup. Right. Yes. like, you need, you need that extra materialization phase right now. Um, it kind of adds like a weird dichotomy between like more aggressive decks and these more controlly decks that or these like level three decks right where um you you really want if you're the if you're the level three deck you really want that first materialization but also you don't want your opponent to be able to attack you first um because it's just one more attack phase for him right like yep it, it, and it's it's a it's a fun give and take um trying to figure out if like you can afford to give them the first turn or not yeah, definitely, and I don't have any solid answers. Uh, sometimes that can be a, that can be tricky to decide. The, yeah, it's um, very. I think it's very highly matchup dependent. Like you, you have to you have to play those games out and figure it out for yourself for sure. There's not. I don't have a good heuristic for it yet. Um, but yeah, I think you know we've covered just about everything here. And <laughs> I say that, and that's not even close to true because this is such <laughs> a 
encompassing topic. Like you could you could talk about this for hours, um, but unfortunately, Dan I think has to go blow his nose or something, being as sick as he is. <laughs> so we'll let him get away. And uh, so thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in and uh, watchers as well on YouTube. Um, we'll see you again in another couple of weeks, uh, two weeks, uh, with another episode of the Recollection Step. Uh, thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.